flooding your mind with the alternative answers. This is All Aware. I am your host, Nathan Roshan. On the topics tonight, we're going to be talking about love, relationships, sex, and even rejection. How to get over rejection. What is rejection? With summer fast approaching us here, it's going to be time for love in the sun. If you don't already have a person of interest and you're looking for one, you might find this topic very interesting. So stay tuned. We'll be right back with sex, love, and relationships on All Aware. All right, and welcome back to the podcast. Today I have David Anthony with me. Um, he's going to be here for the duration of the show, and we're going to be talking about relationships and um, why. What is love? What is love? Um, the difference between love and and lust, and why is it that uh, humans uh, seek relationships, and how come it's easier for some people to find love and find relationships and for other people it's uh it's very hard it's very difficult so uh we're gonna go ahead and dive into some of that um i'm gonna go ahead and pose the question to you dave uh what do you think what is love to you what what would you say you know i i would say it's a chemical reaction i i would say it's a connection made in the brain that becomes hardwired to a degree and we perceive it as love. So you see it as just basically uh, uh, like a chemical or maybe like a feeling uh, that you get? It, it's, it's To me, it's a biological uh, process. Okay. So, I mean, does it, like, to me, when I, when I think of love, I think of like, uh, uh, like a spiritual thing, like an energy, basically, like a, a force field of energy or, or something that that people are attracted to and that pretty much run run everything up to to the universe you know um basically it you know everyone needs it uh it's everybody earns you know yearns for it um everybody seems to gravitate towards it because it's like an energy that is life i don't know i i mean you know, like to a degree, I, I agree that it's an energy. We're all gravitating towards it. Um, what I call it, say, a spirituality or go as far as to say it's a, it's a godly thing. Uh, no, I, I would say it's a biological thing. We're all drawn to it because in some weird way we need it. Um, we've evolved to need it versus other animals that do it just to propagate. You know, we do it because we have a feel a need to be loved. So, I mean, do you think that we need uh we need these feelings to survive? I mean, do we need love to survive as a as a species or or can we just do like the animals like you were just saying do and just and just use it is it just like a um a feeling that that basically lust that we feel for somebody and and just use it to you know, expand our species, or is it something more than that? I, I mean, yes and no. I mean, love's important uh, biologically. 
you, you see this in, in animals, of course, they may not perceive it as love, obviously, but it's when you love someone, you protect them. When you love someone, you look out for them, you make sure their needs are being met, you become equally survivable because we're a species that tends to pick with, stay with one partner as general. Maybe not in the States here anymore, but, uh, well, yeah, so without love, we're basically just going around making children and walking away. <laughs> that, that brings me to my next question, actually, because I was thinking, like, um, do you think, I mean, are we really destined to just be with one person our entire lives, or are we actually biologically um, prone to be with many people in our, in our lives? And, and, you know, the jury's still out on that one. You know, I mean, you would say if you go back, you know, 30 years just here in the U.S., you know, divorce was kind of awkward. It wasn't an, uh, you know, a thing that was common like it is today. Um, but if you look at other cultures, uh, South America, you know, even Mexico, Brazil, uh, Middle East, Africa, even, uh, Australia and stuff, you know, divorce is incredibly rare compared to here. True. Yeah. You know, when you have someone, you stay with them. They're they're no matter how much they annoy you, and and it seems like in the U.S., if they annoy you, you just divorce them. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I mean, it. I guess it depends on where you're from and and your culture. That sounds a lot like religion, though. Like religion and society might play a role then in and and what people perceive love to be and uh, and relationships to be. Um, like you're saying in like Indian stuff, their their religion is such that um, you know they can have you know multiple wives um, and and stuff like that. Where here it's our religion, Christianity, you know, being number one, and and even the non-religious people, you know, our society dictates that we we were to be with one person and you should marry them and spend your whole life you know, together, but it seems like recently over the 10 to 20 years, past 10 or 20 years, that's been changing a lot to almost to where it seems like it's like a free for all. You just do whatever you want and there's no repercussions type of thing. Well, you know, I think the U S has become a, a country where, you know, love is a convenience and when it becomes inconvenient, you move on. Whereas, and if you look at a lot of South American cultures, family is everything. Yeah. You know, no matter how bad the relationship is, they stay together because it's family. You know, you don't see the breakup, if at all, until the kids have left the nest, so to speak, and are fully adults and are married themselves. You know, I mean, people in a lot of other countries, you don't get remarried, not because it's not allowed, or, you know, until the other person passes away. Well, yeah, and they a lot of times they have arranged marriages, you know, where you... You marry who mom and dad says best for you, and then, and then you go on with your life and have kids or whatever. And that's something that's existed for a long time. But if you also look behind it, there's usually something in it for somebody. You know, there's a dowry or there's a family connection that's going to be made. It really, to them, it's it's a decision that's being made based on what somebody wants through greed. You know, you can't marry this person because their family isn't good enough. You know, it's that to me is is something that people are forced to do. That to me is no different than slave labor. It's or you know the sex trade. You're forcing somebody to be with somebody that they may not want to be with. Uh, that's not love to me. That's that's forced companionship. Yeah, that's how I see it too. You know, um, you're being forced to to love somebody or to be in a relationship with somebody and hold that out through the years. And it seems like, you know, there's a lot of politics behind that in those countries too, because a lot of times, you know, it's, it's a certain woman came from a certain family who has to marry this prince or something. And it, and they have those casks or cast. Cast. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, well, think of it like this way, you know, if you, and when a lot of these women, you know, if it's not in a country where your husband dies and you gotta throw yourself on the fire, you know, if, you know, you're suddenly become widowed and you're never allowed to remarry, um, but they'll sit, they, they're happy with it. It's as if like they're fine with what happened that they were married, even if it was for like a day, 
you know, and you ask them, like, did you love them? They're like, absolutely. And, and to me, that's, uh, you know, like Stockholm Syndrome. You know, the, this person becomes your lord and master, and you learn to love them because it's that or nothing. Yeah. You know, you conform or you don't. And if you don't, you know, you'll be unhappy. You know, and, and so that, that's, that's the relationship I see when, when I see, like, you know, marriages like that. Yeah, it just, you know, I guess another topic uh, to talk about that kind of uh, falls in line with that, the society and relationships, um, does, you know, is attraction based on your society, you know? Like, like uh, come back here to America since this is where we've grown up so we know more about our customs here. <laughs> um, Ari, do you think Americans are, are attracted to people based on what they see on TV and the, heard, you know, through the media and advertisements and stuff? Is, is that Does that play a big role? In oh, our- oh, I mean, to say it doesn't, at least in the U.S., is, you know... You know, I guess the answer is yes, it really does. Um, you know, look at when, you know, certain celebrities create a whole style, like, uh, uh, I don't know what her, can't remember her name is from Jersey Shore, the short girl that, you know, was always. Yeah, I like, never watched that. <laughs> yeah, I never watched it really either, but I know it was like Snooky or something. Oh, that was the, yeah, she was, uh, kind of famous for, for being, uh, uh, the less attractive, most <laughs> rambunctious one of the group. <laughs> but but if you look at it, look at her haircut. Yeah. Everyone I started noticing had the Snooky haircut. Like I was seeing her everywhere I turned around. You, even here, like in in Ohio, you know, I go out to any place. There was that haircut, and my friends when I go out would next thing they know like, oh that girl's so hot, like oh it's so great, and I'm like. She's literally got that haircut, you know, or she was wearing the dress that she, you know, it was like this ugly leopard print thing. And, you know, and the girl's like, I got it. I, I saw it. It's the same one that this person celebrity was wearing. It's like, uh, and everyone's like, dude, she looks so good in that. And I'm like, no, not really. Right. Like, no, not really. <laughs> like that looks like the same outfit my mom wore like in 1950, but somehow <laughs> it's, it's hot again. I, I know things go into cycles, but there's a reason why it died for 50 years. <laughs> yeah, I see that too. Like they have that, they have like uh, Britney Spears cologne and all these things that um, celebrities wear. They come out with these lines, and they're instantly a hit. And it's like, so basically, our culture we're idolizing people that are just normal people. They just happen to be on TV or in a in a show. And the Snooky thing is the weirdest thing of all because that's reality TV. It's like you or I, anybody could just go, you know, try out and for the show and, and get a part like that, no problem. There's no ed- education behind that, and it's like, but we're idolizing that now. So, well, you know, I think we, for, as far as the media is concerned, you know, we conform too easily as a people to what the media says is hot without even them, them having to say it. You know, I like, I don't know if you noticed these, you know, I see very, you know, various women that I would find very attractive until they turn and half their head is shaven. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's sick. And, and it's like combed over. And, and I'm like, what? I, I don't get it. Or it's like half gray and half blonde and it's the, the, the blondes, you know, combed over the gray. And it's like, what are you, are you, are you, are you 60? Like. And and my friends are like, oh, dude, look at that chick. She's so cool. And I'm like, well, dude, if I shaved half my head, that doesn't mean I'm cool. That just means I shaved half my head and I'm something's wrong. I, I don't know. Right. <laughs> you know, I guess, you know, asymmetry or something, I guess. I, but that's something in the media. And suddenly everyone, you know, it's like being in high school. The, the popular kid says this is the cool thing and then everybody does it. Right. It's I know, but you know, that's like high school and it's like this is real life, but it it's like we still play by those those rules in, in a sense. And uh <laughs> well, because we well, at least in the US, we've become, you know, a society where media dictates what's right and wrong, what we should look like, how we should act, you know, and and they're the leaders. So 
you know, when a person doesn't look like anybody specific, they looks like they dress, you know, five years ago, you know, we just subconsciously now just look right past them. Right. When if it'd be like a, you know, one of those movies where you suddenly they do some crazy 80s mount montage and in a beauty salon, they walk out looking like a princess. Mm-hmm. You know, you'd be shocked at how many women just if they, you know, did something or even guys, you know, if they took five minutes to dress themselves instead of just whatever they had around the house, they could look presentable. It's called cleaning up, <laughs> you know, but today it's. You're only clean if cleaned up, so to speak. If you've, you know, if you've followed some celebrity's advice on outfits. True. Which I don't agree with, man. I think that's so stupid, you know. But, you know, <laughs> I guess it is what it is. And, uh, I guess maybe that will bring us to this point is, um, you know, do men and women have different views on what's, what a relationship is and how to attract a relationship. Well, absolutely. I mean, we've had that debate, you know, as far as, you know, not just our society, every society, you know, since, you know, relationships started, you know, I, women will say just as much, you know, that they don't understand men as men will say, I don't understand women at all. Mm -hmm. You know, they both think the other is crazy, you know, and, but it's funny that you, you know, what they think is different. You know, to women, most men don't take the time to ask them questions or have a deep, meaningful conversation. And men will say, you know, a similar thing, but they'll turn it and say, you know, they're never around, you know, when I want them around or they don't put out, you know, they, it's, for men, it's more of a sexual thing. You know, as long as they're, you know, sexed up, so to speak, they're good, which is why most women will say that, you know, men only think of one thing. And it's true. You know, that's the majority of our thoughts. Yeah, that's true. I will admit. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but to women, you know, they know that. But they'll they'll complain that we're just we don't take the time to listen to them. We, we're not romantic enough. Yeah, you know, you hear that, and it's, but, you know, and with the the guy and, and the sexual thing, like, yeah, you think about it, but, you know, some of us, we want more than that. I mean, that, yeah, that's the forefront of our mind, because as men, that's biologically how we, you know, just, just how we are. I, I can't answer that other than saying that that is how well, we are. Well, we have a, we both have a drive. It's, it's what triggers that drive that's different, so to speak. And for women, you know, you're like you're saying it's. I guess it's it's more romance and and the chase and the uh, the protector. Yeah, I mean, they want security. They want you know. A lot of people say, "Oh, I got to be rich to get a chick like that or this." It's like true in in a, in a way because you know it, you know you don't necessarily have to be rich, but you got to have something. You know, I mean, a girl doesn't want to move in with you and live in a shoebox. Well, they see you money know. as protection. They see money as protection because that's what society, you know, has taught them. Whereas, you know, 30 years ago, people were happy to get married and live in a crappy apartment and until they built up something. Right. You know, they didn't matter where they ended up, you know. But today, you know, we're definitely in a society where if you have no money, you're not going to be happy at all. I mean, you're going to be fighting 24 hours a day, you know, just to feed yourself. And a woman doesn't want to have to fight when she has a man that can do it. So, yeah, they're attracted to certain things, just as much as we're attracted to certain things as well. So I would call that entitlement, though, man. It seems like like these days, if you're talking about men, women in their 20s, early 30s, that basically what I'm hearing you say is they're, they feel like they're entitled. They're entitled to these certain things, like, you know, uh, money and and uh, a, a nice place to live, maybe um, an easy place to live where they can get to their job, a nice car or something like that. They're entitled. They feel entitled to these things, you know. And well, it's it's to me. I don't see that as right. I don't. Think I mean, right. I mean, you're right, but you look at it a different way. Is that you know when you're in a relationship or starting out, 
and she's evaluating you, you're evaluating her, she's thinking, you know, five years from now when I have a kid, you know, or how safe is my kid going to be? You know, is this person reliable? Is are they are they job worthy? Are they going to provide for me? You know, I mean, of course, nowadays, you know, women provide for themselves, True. and which is a good thing. But if it's a one sided thing, you know, if she thinks that well, this guy's going to have a kid with me and bail, you know, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, if, if you want to call that entitlement, I mean. It depends on the level. I mean, yeah, you'll get the ones that are just straight up gold diggers and same with guys. You know, they want them sugar mamas. They want the women that have the money and whatever and will give them everything they want. And when they don't, they leave. But women do the same thing. Mm hmm. No, you know, yeah. you want to put the word love in there. That's fine. It doesn't mean it's love. Mm -hmm. You know, then you could say, you know, lust entitlement or something, you know. And, but like I said, there's a level and, you know, I'm not saying that if a girl has to, you know, if she's like, oh, he better have like a six figure job, then we got a problem. Yeah. You know, then there's something else going on. But if she's like, listen, as long as he's got a job, you know, he's not like a rapist, you know, then we're good. You know, like then we got potential. But it's when people put too many um, restrictions or haves and have nots that you know, we're setting ourselves up and society keeps adding those things, you know, how many people we have to date or, you know, what kind of jobs they have to have or how much they have to make, where they live. And now you're seeing more and more women, you know, in surveys that keep saying that they are not going to ever get married. Yeah. You know, and society, because it's getting to the point where it's an, a free for all now. It seems you know, like it, yeah. And, you know, that's that's society. Where you go other places, it's it, divorce rate might be climbing, but it's still not a free-for-all. You know, we're not out for ourselves, where women are like, I'm going to have a kid, but I'm going to get a donor. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, man. Like, I got to admit, I, I'm horrible with, with women and in relationships and stuff. And it's, you know, a lot of people ask me, even even um, girls that I have as friends or that I've known in the past, or they're like, you know, why not? Like, why don't you have a chick? Or, you know, why don't you have a kid by now? Or why everybody thinks the world, but they don't know why. And, and I essentially don't either, because I seem to have the same problems um, finding chicks that a lot of other guys do. Um and funny enough, I've actually had some friends that were girls in the past that were having problems finding guys. And, you know, after talking with them, it's it's almost like the same thing. But it's like we're both meeting each other, you know, like we're I, actually we're both missing, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I see it as, you know, we we are in a society where we set, you know, these but what we'll be willing to accept, you know, our standards, if you will, and I say that in air quotations, hmm. you know, they have to have this, they have to have that. Like I was saying earlier, you know, he's got to be hot, she's got to be the hot, you know, I say just say attraction, mm -hmm. you know, because what is hot is relative. Exactly. Um, and they got to, you know, be self-sufficient. I don't want a guy who's like, you know, living out in a box behind the grocery store you know, and she's, you know, and he's like, well, I want a chick with a job. I don't want a kid. I don't want a girl with a kid. Whatever, whatever the standard is. When I, but, you know, the issue is to me, it's not about standards. It's about what you can tolerate. Mm. You know, because if you're looking for somebody and you're like, listen, I think she's beautiful. She's smart. But man, she's got all these issues. Am I willing to put up with that? If you are, then you have a high tolerance for whatever it is. Then it may work. Is that was that? I think that's what we call settling. <laughs> no, no, not necessarily. I mean, because you could be in a relationship with someone, and you know, it's funny. You ask any pe pe any person who's been married for years and years, and you say, like, could you list all the person's fault, things that get under your skin? They'll probably spend two hours telling you about all the things that get under their skin and bothers them, but yet they're still together. Right. And, and, you know, to me, it's it's a kind of like a two-part factor. It's what are you able to tolerate, 
and how quickly did you, you know, get forced to tolerate it? Did you just start out the relationship and in the first week you found out, you know, she has the most annoying laugh in the world, she overspends, you know, she does this, she does that, all these things you hate too quickly that you can't tolerate it, so you just, it ends. Or do you find stuff out over time and you have time to adjust and, you know, is that the kind of person they are? You know, and every time you find out something new, and remember, they're finding things out about you, too. Right. And people don't realize that, that, you know, you might sit there and say, yeah, it takes time. This is why I tell people, you know, rushing into relationships, just generally a bad idea. You know, because within about 17 months to 18 months of a relationship, those chemical bonds that you that first started, they start to break away. Right. They actually degrade. And when, if the, if the bond is strong enough, it will not fully degrade. It'll stop at some point. And that's when you can say, all right, I can, I can fight this. You know, yeah. any problem that comes up, we can truly get over it. But it's when they start out in the first month and they're like, oh, that's fine. That's fine. Well, eventually it's, it's like a poke. How many times can you get poked before it goes from bruised to bloody to open wound? Yeah. So, yeah. So I guess my biggest thing, um, like, I, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty nice guy. I'm a pretty good guy. I'd say, I, you know, like I was saying earlier, a lot of people have, have praised me or whatever, whatever. You know, I'm just a normal dude, but I'm at least a decent, you know, respectful guy. Sure. And, you know, I just, I've always gotten to a point, but I've never, but then something happens, and, and I think that, it's like a fear of rejection. I think I'm afraid of rejection at some point. Like, I might even get them on a date. I might get them to say, yeah, we're in a dating relationship. I might get them in the bed or, or whatever. But at some point, there's something that I'm afraid of. And why is that? What is that? Why am I afraid? I mean, why is that such a big thing? Like, you know, mm -hmm. rejection. I mean, it it comes down to it. It's it's rejection because you know, like we said earlier, we all we do have an inherent biological need. Uh, you know, like Maslow uh, would say, you know, we have a, a need for you know sex. We have a need for to feel uh, loved, to feel accepted. We we have these drives. They are a part of our psyche, and. For some reason, for someone to say, no, I don't accept you, which means I will not be loving you, and you will not therefore be accepted and, and cared for, then that's like, you know, a punch in the face. Right. And that's why we're afraid, because we're afraid at any moment, that's what's going to happen. So it's is it like an ego thing that's making us afraid, or I mean, is it just a confidence thing? We're we're just people are just not very confident in themselves, you know? Why why can't we just go out and go around and meet people and ask them well, out and what? I, I I say that we can be confident in ourselves. You know, we can believe in ourselves. We know we can do it. the The question is is do we feel confident of the outcome? You know, if you feel that the outcome or you psych yourself out and say the outcome is probably not going to end well because the last two times it didn't, we're going to doubt the outcome. We're not going to doubt our skills. Of course, you can talk to somebody because if she came up to you, let's say, and started talking to you, you would have no problem talking to her, right? Well, true. I mean, I mean, I'd be nervous probably because I don't know the person. I don't really know what to say to respond to what I don't know what she's going to ask. But am I more willing to talk to him? Am I? Yeah, I definitely will, and I and I'm going to make the best of that for sure. Well, yeah, because you're you know the fear of rejection goes down a hell of a lot when the other person initiates it. You know, it's like they have the confidence, but then you know all you really have to do is stick with it. Yeah. You know, so yeah, I mean, it's confidence. I, I'd say, you know, the fear of rejection and confidence is kind of one and the same. And yeah, I mean, everyone's a little different. You know, like for me, I'm not af afraid of rejection, 
but there are times where I don't have confidence when I've analyzed the situation and I say, listen, I bet you if that girl was by herself, you know, I would have no problem. But she's got an army of friends around her, so now, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's it's not about, you know, rejection. You're not worried about what the other friends are rejecting you. You're not trying to go after them. True. You know, I don't care what their friends think. The problem is, is that, but my confidence that I'll succeed goes drastically down mm -hmm. because you're not used to having to fight five women to get to one. Yeah. You true. know, and some don't care. Yeah. Um, I, I would agree with that. Um, but I don't know, like what, you know, guys and girls, you know, what can be done? Like, how can we, make it easier for i mean ourselves to to meet people to get out there and uh get over whatever it is so we can actually find these relationships find this love you know the so-called love this um you know this uh companionship and um you know I guess I, I kind of remember um, before the inter um, before the interview here before the podcast you were talking about something about a salesman theory. What what do you mean by that a salesman it's, theory? Yeah. yeah, it's it's imagine this. I mean, I, I like to use metaphors when I talk to people and, and give them a lot of examples that they can relate to and try to translate into other things. Um, and the salesman is a good example of you know the difference between kind of rejection and not or the feeling you get. So, um, you know, if you're a salesperson, you work any job where you have to talk to people, even if it's paper or plastic, all right? You know, the person who's selling something doesn't feel rejected when you don't like their product. You know, but when I sold stuff and the customer said, you know, I'm just not interested, thank you, you know, have a great day, I, I didn't feel hurt, it was, well, that sucks. I didn't get the sale, so I'll wait for the next person to walk in the door. The, the reason why they don't feel rejected because they're not, the, the customer is not rejecting the salesman. They're rejecting the product in the, in the mind of the salesperson. You know, it's easy. If you're selling, say, a lawnmower and you got five people that come to look at it and each one just says, you know, I'm not interested. I don't like your lawnmower or whatever. You're not hurt. You know, you're just, oh, the person didn't want my, my lawnmower. You might get irritated, but you don't feel rejected. And, and that's because you're, you're not getting hurt. Yeah. It's like the lawnmower's getting hurt, but you're not. But when you talk to, say, a guy or a girl and they say, you know, I'm just not interested, they're not rejecting what you're selling. They're rejecting you. Yeah, true. And that's what hurts. And you have, you know, and they say, well, how do I get over that? Well, you know, and then I tell them, you know, what if every salesperson anywhere, including, say, fast food, you drive up and you pull up and not nobody sells anything without being asked first? C can you imagine that? I mean, it'd be kind of weird if you just go up and you're just at the window or the, the speaker and... You're like, oh, hello, are you closed? Uh, can I get some food? Or <laughs> Exactly. You know, we're, we're, if we have to, we'll ask. But it, 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 to me, that says each person is waiting for the other person to say something. And we just don't realize it. Yeah. And so the first thing I tell people, you know, they have to do is, is that, yes, when you are about to talk to somebody – you're selling yourself. But a good salesperson, when they're selling themselves or a product, builds rapport first. They don't go straight up to a person and start hitting on them. Hey, baby, what's up? Or hi, handsome, looking good. You know, they, they just don't. And if they do do that, well, you're likely going to get slapped or they're going to turn away and just be, like, disgusted. You know, I mean, I've had women that are attractive that have come up to me and came on, and the first thing in my mind is, you know, one, is this a joke, or are you trying to get free drinks, or, you know, what do you, what's in it for you? Why, why are you talking to me like this? This is way too easy. Yeah. 
but if they had come up to me and talked to me like a regular human being, what kind of drink is that? I've never seen that. Or, you know, I don't see guys drink fruity drinks like that. Or, you know, what what is with guys in hard liquor or beer? Would you ever drink a fruity drink? You know, something, you know, or you could go up to a girl and ask them a weird question. Like, what's your favorite ice cream? I just, I just have to know. You know, nobody talks to anybody when they're, when they're attracted to them like a human being anymore. Yeah, so basically just go up and talk to them like you already know them or, or like they're just a person and not like some kind of formality where you have to ask a, a certain type of question or whatever to sound like what, what, I, what I'm getting from you. Yeah, I mean, you don't, and, and it's not in every situation. I mean, let's face it, if there's a group of them, you got to, you know, yeah, we were much more intimidated, if you will. Um, but... You know, you, you have to remember these are human beings too. And if they're single too, then they're likely looking, whether they want to admit it or not. And regardless of how attractive you think they are, whether it's society says they're attractive or you think they're attractive, you know, they're human and they probably aren't going to bite. They're probably not going to slap you unless you do something you're not supposed to be doing. So, you know, less like with guys, if a girl comes up to a guy, you know, she'll have to work pretty hard to get him to want to walk away. This is true. But, you know, it baffles me that people take it so personal when if they're selling anything else, there's no problem. But when it comes to selling ourselves, we have problems translating it. And I think it's because we we have a lack of experience. If you don't truly know the product, then how can you sell it? You know, if you don't truly want to admit to yourself how you really are, what kind of a person you are, you know, then how can you sell it to somebody else? But I think that that's even to that degree is looking at it too quickly. You know, just start small. Find something that you think would be a good icebreaker. But remember, at the same time, what do you got to lose? That's true, man. And it seems, at least from my personal experience, by not doing it, whatever it is that you want to do, whether it be talk to a girl or ask for a girl's number or a guy's number or go on, you know, some trip with people, whatever it may be, if 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 you don't attempt it or if you don't do it, you know, as you go through life, you're going to start regretting it. And you're going to be like, well, what if? Then it's going to become this what if. Whereas before, if you would have just did it, even say it was a no or it maybe you went on a trip with a group of people when it was horrible but now you know, so now, you know, you're not saying what if, what if, and making this um, elaborate uh, uh, fantasy in your mind of, of what could have happened. You know what happened, so. It, it's the classic case of the coulda, shoulda, wouldas. Yeah. And, you know, it gets me every time that, you know, it's a, is it better to, you know, it's the question, is it better to have loved and lost than who have ever loved before, you know. It's tough, uh, yeah. I, you know, yeah, sure, we've all been hurt. Just remember that. I mean, you can sit there and say, you know, I've been hurt. I don't want to get hurt again. Well, guess what? I guarantee you they've probably been hurt, too. You know, we all have baggage. Let, let's face it. You know, and, you know, we're afraid that if we go up to this one girl or a guy that they're going to say no. Well, guess what? That might happen. You know, that's reality. They may say no. They may blow you off. They may use you for a drink or something else, you know. I mean, this is human nature. This is human beings. We're not perfect. In a perfect world, you find the person you like, and it works. But that's not what we live in. And I think people don't put themselves in a mentality where I, you know, I try to tell them put them put yourself in a in a mentality like it's a game, or that you're pretending to sell something, you know, and this thing you're pretending to sell is yourself. Now, how would you sell yourself to an employer? You True. Know? Yeah, job interviews. People go on those all the time, man. And after you go on enough of them, you get get familiar with it, and then you're pretty good at it. And then you can almost land any job that you get an interview in, you know? Yeah, but most people get an interview. If they don't get the job, you know, yeah, they feel a little hurt, you know, because they've been personally rejected. You know, what's wrong with me? But it doesn't, the, the, the sting doesn't seem to last as long. No, I agree. Because it's it's a it tends to be more of a calculated decision and not as much of an emotional decision. You know, they didn't like me because I wasn't qualified, you know, or I didn't communicate well. But it has nothing to do with my personality or how good of a person I really am. It's just my personal skills. 
so it doesn't hurt as much as if they said, you know, I just, you know, you came in here and I just didn't like your personality. You know, I think you're a hor- horrible person. You know, then it'd be like, ouch. But they don't do that. So, but you have no problem going to an interview. You'll go into it confident. You'll go into it saying, I want to get this job. And, but yet when it comes to, you know, the opposite sex or, or same sex or whatever floats your boat, you know, and you go after it, you know, we have this, you know, fear that it's going to somehow hit us so hard. And in reality, how many times have you looked or asked a girl out if you ever did and got rejected? And do you even remember every time? I mean, I, I don't think so. I think, I think, you know, people, have asked people and not even realized it, or you just, you know, if you're at a party, let's say you talk to a few people. I mean, if you're out on the prowl and you find people attractive, you're probably going to ask three or four or five people that you meet, you know, for their number or, Hey, do you want to hang out? Or, Hey, what are you doing tomorrow? Or, I mean, that's, wouldn't you group all that into the same, same thing as, as trying to further a relationship uh, with that person? Well, sure, you know, and and I think that the reason why we feel rejection is because we're asking that person out. So how do you how do you get beyond that? How do I get over rejection? Well, don't ask them out. That's that's what it comes down to. When you're talking to this person, don't ask them out. What but, do you, What do you mean by that? Well, stay away from things that'll be perceived as a date. Okay. You know, instead of saying, hey, can I take you out to dinner or or I just, you know, I love it when people just try to say, oh, we should hang out sometime. (laughs) You know, what does that mean? Really? You know, so I look at it as if you were to ask somebody out, in your mind you're asking them out, but you need to make sure it's not perceived like that. You say, well, hey, there's this, you know, festival coming up. You know, I could really use someone to come with me. It'd be awesome. I don't want to walk around this thing alone. You know, would you join me? That doesn't come across as a date so much. So if you get rejected, you could just in your mind say, well, I wasn't asking them on a date. I was asking if they wanted to walk around with me. True. You know, That's and therefore good. rejection doesn't sting as much. It's when we ask people on a date and we get rejected that if for some reason we take it so personal. So with that, it's more like that job interview where, yeah, they weren't rejecting me. They they didn't want to go to the event. That's what you could see in your mind, right? You know. Yeah, or you know, think of it like this: if you go somewhere and you ask somebody for quick assistance, hey, you know, I don't know you, but can you help me take this stuff to my car? And they say no. Okay. Well, you don't feel hurt. Yeah. Because you weren't asking them to do anything emotional. You know, there was no emotional attachment, but. By doing that, if you were to, if they were to say, okay, well, that's non-threatening. He didn't ask me to go to dinner where it was clearly a romantic thing, but it, that gives you also the opportunity to be with that person one on one, you know, by, by yourselves, you know, which is, you know, really important, which gives you that opportunity to build a relationship right then and there. Now, a lot of people say, oh, that puts you right in the friend zone. It might, yeah. but you know what? If you get rejected after that, it's still all I did was I had fun. I asked them for this. I thought they might be cool, you know, and a lot of, you know, opposites. Like, they'll know, but it's about the non-threat, you know. Well, see, like me, I don't, I don't, I don't want any, I I guess I might be kind of weird, but I kind of have this thing where I don't want uh, a girl as a friend. I don't know. It's just some weird thing with me, but but I see your point where, like, even if it is just, like, a friendship that develops out of it, like, that's one more person you know that knows people, that knows other people. You know, you you you, you expand your circle and you never know, you well, know. But, like, let's say, like I say, okay, well, there's this cool concert. I don't want to go alone. Would you be interested in going with me? So let's say, you know, in the case I asked a girl out and she says yes. Well, halfway through the concert, you know, I could say, well, hey – when the concert's over, would you care to go to dinner with me? Yeah, yeah. You know, you can it's build it's, on that. Yeah. It's it's you can build on what you're doing. Now, sure, if you keep asking them to events and hey, where I'm going to the bar with my friends, yeah, you're gonna get put in the friend zone. 
the reason why is because you didn't make your intentions clear in the beginning. Make so yep. if you don't make your intentions clear, then they immediately put you in the friend zone, in my opinion. But, you know, you you can get them to a place where it's non-threatening. And to you, you want to feel rejection because you're not asking them on a date. You're just asking them to go hang out. But this is where planning comes into effect. Don't just try to say, oh, you know, you want to go to this random park with me. That's date-ish. Have an event. Have something that's coming up that you know about, date, time, place, you know, the who, what, where, when, and why. Make sure it's non-threatening, something that two people could enjoy together, but not lovey-dovey. And as soon as you get there, you know, you can kind of lay it on a little bit. Not not too thick, but, hey, you know, after this, you know, you want to grab something to eat. You can then push it into things that are more romantic. And during the whole time, you can just, when you first see them, like, wow, you know, you, you know, you just, you're blowing my mind right now. And she'll be like, oh, why? Oh, because, you know, you're just, you're beautiful right now. I don't know why. But you leave it at that. You don't lay it on too thick. It's quick comments here and there. You hint. Yeah, that's good. I like you that. know, and and that's where I say you know it's not it's not putting them in an awkward situation, and it's not you know risking you being rejected because it's still not a date. You just made a nice comment. You gave them a compliment. You know who doesn't like to be complimented? But there's too many compliments, and it becomes pretty obvious. You know, it's almost like a psychological game you're playing. But if you do it this way, you eliminate rejection. That's that's the only way to get over rejection is to just take it out of the equation, you know. And over time, you'll you'll develop this whole I don't care. You'll be a little bit more bold, you know. You'll you not you'll not care. I, I shared with you uh, a while back the the phone trick, what, you know, what's that the what? the subconscious you know trick that you know. You know, if I were to say, Nate, you need to go ask this, ask for this girl's number, how would you feel? Um, uh, I mean, I'd be nervous, but that's just because I, I'm just a nervous dude when it comes to meeting new people. I, I, I mean, it depends. Or is she alone or is she with a group? I'm going to assume a group because they're never alone. <laughs> well, so. true. I mean, but let's say she works somewhere and you say, okay, well, I like this girl, you know, I've, I've seen her a couple times. She works somewhere. Let's say she's a bartender. I know, I know what you're talking about. I've done that in the past where you just basically, you know, you hand them your phone and say, put your number in there. You yeah, know? I mean, don't even say that. Just, you or know. Just hand them the phone. It works every time, yeah. Yeah, it, you know, it, they it's, like that. it's yeah. subconscious. It shows confidence. You don't have to ask. No. I mean, so I wouldn't fear rejection if I don't even have to ask a question. Yeah. I, I take my phone. I have it preset to the dial pad. Yep. And when I'm ready, I unblack the screen and hand them the phone. I don't say anything. They know what to do. Yeah, I have done the same thing and it, it's it's so amazing how it actually works. And like you said, like you, you're not getting rejected if they if they hand it back to you because you're like, "Okay, whatever." But that almost 9 times out of 10, maybe even more, they don't hand it back to you without having that number in the phone. Exactly. And for me, it's it's a confidence thing. Like, I have no problem. I mean, would you have a problem handing someone your phone? That's it. Right. That's all you're doing. You're handing someone your phone. And and this puts it in the mindset, too, is that they gave you their number. Exactly. You didn't ask for it. All you did was hand them a phone. They did all the rest. If they didn't want you to have their number, they would not have put it in. If a girl comes up to me and hands me their phone... And in their numbers, I am automatically assuming this person likes me. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to give them my number if I like them. You know, they don't have to ask for my number. I'm going to just give it to them. I'm going to program it in there. I'm going to give them my name in case I forgot their name, which happens a lot with me. I'll forget their name. Yeah. And, cool. and I'll hand them my phone. And not only do I have their number, but I got their their name that they programmed into it just being nice to me and and then they'll almost always they'll tell me to call them real quick so that they have my number. You know, if the, if you have no chance, they won't give you a number. So okay, let's talk about getting numbers and stuff. Do you think? Do you? You know, what I hate is a lot of my friends and and just people in general that I hear talking. They're always talking like 
like people are out of their league. What is this league shit? Do you believe in leagues? I mean, that it's stupid. It's like 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 we were talking about at the beginning of of the the broadcast, you know, attraction is relative and and I truly believe that. I mean, everybody finds a little something different attractive than the last girl or guy or whatever. So, what is this league thing and and do we really have to stick to like if 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 you go on hotornot.com, which might be outdated now for some listeners. Yeah, you actually have to pay for it now. Oh, are you serious? Yeah, you got to pay for it. I went on there not long ago just for fun and see if it still existed. And you have to actually sign up for a membership. Huh. And I was like, oh, but you can still, like, if you have had a profile on there, you can still look it up. Okay. But, you know, the photos are, like, 10 years old, so you look, yeah. you know, like a 5-year-old. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, and I, I was still a 7 yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Like, say say you're a seven. So so let's say you go on there. Like, you're a seven, right? So so does that mean you can only go after people that are seven, seven and below? And below. Yeah, <laughs> you, you know, I, I, and that's where it, attraction is relative. You know, I mean, I've dated girls that you know, in in my eyes, each one of them was just gorgeous, ten out of ten. But to everyone else around me, they were average. Nothing special looking. I would have just passed them on the street. Wouldn't have given them a second glance. You know. Yeah, yeah. You so had some weird, weird, it, attractive. <laughs> yeah. Um, but if you also look at it, is that when people usually say out of a league, it means that a girl typically looks like a stereotype. You know, if a girl looks like Barbie, if a girl looks like a celebrity, you know, and acts like a celebrity and is rich and whatever. And they'll say, oh, they're out of your league. You know, what it, what they're saying is, is that they're in a, a part of society almost like the caste system, you know, to where they will not like you. So let's say you, you find a, a very attractive woman and she, to you, okay? Mm-hmm. And sure. she, and she's a, uh, she works as a cleaner and, and, uh, for a cleaning company, you know, she cleans homes and uh, businesses and bathrooms and stuff like that. Well, would that be out of your league? Basically, is it like based on professions? Is it based on money? Or is it just based on their looks? Is that girl going to be out of somebody's league because she's beautiful or because she's working there? Uh, let's say that same girl worked at uh, some huge company and and was a lawyer or something now suddenly is she you know (laughs) out of your league now or not it's 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 relative it when i say out of league it usually i don't care what others say because what others say is their personal bubble you know what they think is is league and what's not league for them you know it's what if what's what you think is out of your league so if I think, you know, a person who works at, say, you know, a cleaning company, like you said, you know, is within my thing, and a lawyer is, you know, let's say the same girl suddenly, you know, graduates, now she's a freaking high t- high-priced high lawyer. Right. You know, suddenly she's out of my league. Well, to me, that's saying that, you know, I have my own self-confidence issues. I, I can't be with somebody who surpasses me. You know, that you have no self, you don't have enough self-respect, you know, to say, well, yeah, okay, well, she might be a lawyer and I'm a janitor, even though she still loves me no matter what. It's the same person. That's, that was my point too. Like, but it's, it's the same person, but it's suddenly it's out of somebody's league, you know. It, you know, and, and you're only out of someone's league if you don't have the confidence to put up with it. And, and here's one thing, and I, and I, you know, I admit it, I, I love, I have dated, I wouldn't say I loved, but I've, I've dated a number of dancers. Okay. <laughs> oh. Okay. And use your imagination. Okay. Now, a lot of guys, you know, will sit there and when they're at the club and, and their whole goal is to try to pick these girls up and they never do. You know, and the, the, the question I got all the time was, was like, how do you date a girl like that? You know, and it's like, well, I'm secure. Mm-hmm. You know, and if you're not secure with yourself, you're not going to be able to handle when she's, you know. Oh, it's not a PG show, so you can say it. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, uh, 
if if you can't handle the fact that she is going to be grinding up against dudes dicks and and you know kissing them on the neck and everything you know and you can't get over the fact that it's just a show yeah that the simple fact that sex sells but she's not actually having sex yep then you don't have the self confidence you're either your jealousy is getting in the way your self confidence you think that she's going to go off with another dude you know, and the same thing happens with women and or men, you know, in different careers. Now, when a guy apparently has like some crazy awesome job, you know, the woman typically I find doesn't really care if, if, as long as he's able to provide the better he's able to provide the better. You know, but in the opposite, you know, we're almost intimidated. You know, it's dating a if a guy like me who doesn't have a job and you know is trying to date this girl and she's she's a high priced lawyer or hell she just has a decent job it's intimidating it is i agree and and that's the problem you know is that you can sit there and that's when you know to me league is nothing more than intimidation okay there's a certain level that you can that is too intimidating for you and then beyond that you're out, it's out of your league it's your own fault. It's your own mentality. I agree. And hey, we're actually going to be running out of time here shortly. We got about a minute and a half, two minutes left. So I'm going to go ahead and ask you um, if you could just leave, what do you believe are some steps uh, to success? We've kind of covered a lot of this in, in, in the later half here, but if you want, if you could leave the people with uh, just maybe some pointers and sure. you know, what can you do to, to get out there and get, get active? Okay, well, the first is, you know, when you talk to a girl and you have rejection is your biggest thing, take it out of the equation. Talk to them, come up with something, you know, to try to get them to join you with something that is not a date, that would never be perceived as a date. You know, the second thing is when you when you try to get her number, just hand her your phone. Don't Don't... Slide your number over on a piece of paper. Don't ask her for a number. Just hand her the phone, and she'll take care of the rest. If she doesn't, you got your answer. No big deal. You know, and the whole time, don't seem desperate. You know, if she does give you that number, don't show up tomorrow. Don't call her a 100 times. You know, it's like a salesperson. You know, you say you call, you say, I'm interested in something, and then they call you 500 times to see if you're still interested. After a while, you just want to block their call. Well, the same thing happens when you call a girl or a guy. They're like, wow, this person's needy, desperate, something. It never ends good. You know, just call them to confirm that they're willing to do whatever you asked them to do before, whether it's a concert, a an event, a cool thing, you know, some kind of show, whatever. But take the fear out of it. What would, what would you do that you wouldn't be afraid to do? And then apply it. And that's it. Uh, I hear that. It sounds good. And we are out of time. So I just want to thank you, David Anthony, for coming on the podcast tonight. Pleasure. And, uh, you have been writing a, uh, a book called Deeper Decisions. Um, and that's not quite done yet, though, is, am I correct on that? Yeah, it's on the last chapter, um, you know, writer's block, trying to put it all together. But, yeah, it's the psychology of decision-making. And a lot of people have already liked it. Very metaphorical, the whole book. All right, well, you'll have to keep mm -hmm. us informed on that. And then when it comes out, we'll put that up on our website and everything. And uh Hopefully gets that promoted out there for you. And uh, for All Aware in the True Rants Network, I am your host, Nathan Roshan, and we are out. Have a good night.